finishing, hopefully, real quickly, uh, whatever it is, book of three. Um, so we saw at the end of that yeah, penultimate chapter, Gwydion doesn't know what gift to give Taryn. And Taryn just says, I want to go home. Notice the circle. How the final section of the last chapter kind of mimics close to the first chapter. In the first chapter, what does Taryn seemingly want? He wants to leave. Because he can't become a hero. He can't earn fame or glory, he thinks, all right, in Caradalvin. So they make their way back to Caradalvin, and we're told. Um, Dalvin, you know, welcomes, welcomes Ilan, Williams, Lunder, et cetera, et cetera. And he asks everybody to leave because he wants to talk to Karen. Bottom of 184, top of 185. This will probably take maybe five to ten minutes at most. <clears throat> So, Taryn goes in, Dalvin shuts the book that he's been reading, for book of three, and says, I should like the two of us to speak quietly to each other. First, I'm interested to learn what you think of being a hero. Okay? That's what you wanted, right? So what do you think? I have no just cause for pride, Taryn says. Taking his usual place on the familiar bench. It was Gwydion who destroyed the Horn King, and Henwin helped him do it. In other words, I didn't do it, right? But Gurdy, not I, found her. So Gwydion killed the Horn King, Henwin helped him, Gurdy found Henwin, not me. Dolian flew there, fought gloriously, while I was wounded by a sword I had no right to draw. What's Taryn getting at? Yeah, I didn't do anything. And Ilanwi was the one who took the sword from the barrow in the first place. What good was I? Okay. As for me, what I mostly did was make mistakes. Dobbin, my, my. Those are complaints enough to dampen the merriest feast. In other words, we got you got back here, and from what I've heard, you're a hero. And you just keep dumping cold water on it. Though what you say may be true, you have cause for a certain pride nevertheless. It was you who held the companions together and led them. Now, Taryn thinks every decision he made was wrong. Was his decision to go to Caradathel after he lost Gwydion wrong? No. Was his decision to leave the Hidden Valley after Medwin said, you can stay, and you can live here forever. No. Okay. Yeah, he made some wrong decisions along the way. But along the way, he gathered to him, even though he didn't call them, so to speak, he gathered to him Fluter, Ilanwi, Doli, you know, the Gwythaint, kind of, Gurgi, and they stuck to him like glue, no matter what. You did what you set out to do. And what was that? When he first left, what did he set out to do? Get Henwin. Okay. Henwin is safely back with us. If you made mistakes, notice, you recognize. Say something here. I don't think that I want to. As I told you, there are times when the seeking counts more than the finding. What did Taryn want when he left? He wanted to be the one to rescue him. Was he personally the one to do that? No, he wasn't. And yet, it was because of his decision initially to leave. That enabled all the dominoes to fall. That brought him with ultimately safely back. Notice what else. Dalvin, hold on, let me make sure. Dalvin goes on. 
Does it truly matter which of you did what? Friends, all shared the same goal and the same danger. Nothing we do is ever done entirely alone. Okay? Well, what, he, what he means by that, or what he's saying there is, none of us, as much as we might think we are, is entirely independent. In, think of that word, in the pendant. The root is this. What is something that is a pendant? What does pendant mean? A hand, like this one. You know, a pendulum. A pen means hanging and it's moving back and forth. So something that is pendant is something that is hanging, right? Dependent means away from, out from, hanging from. Something that is pendant hangs from something else. This, you could say, this hangs from this cord. A cord hangs around my neck. If it's independent, then it doesn't hang from anything. It is self-hanging, so to speak, right? Dalvin is saying, none of us are independent. We all depend to some extent on others. There is a part of us and everyone else. You of all people should know that. From what I hear, you have been as, as impetuous as your friend Fluid. I've been told, among other things, of a night you dove headfirst into a thorn bush. And you have certainly felt as sorry for yourself as Gurgi and like Dolly, driven for the impossible. Terry, yeah, but that's not what matters. That's not what troubled me. I often dreamed, Kara Dolvin, and I loved it. And you and call more than ever. I ask for nothing better to be at home and my heart rejoices. But it's a curious feeling. Why? I have returned to the chamber I slept in and found it smaller than I remember. Why? And how? I mean, you could give the scientific answer. What has happened? in the intervening several months. He's grown. We find at the beginning of the next book, which is a year after this book, or the next year, okay? Let me rephrase that. It's a year from the beginning of this book, uh, Black Cauldron. Because we're told at the beginning of Black Cauldron, Dalvin is 379. We're told in uh, beginning of the Book of Three, we're told in the Black Cauldron that Dalvin is 380. So from the Book of Three beginning to the Black Cauldron beginning, one year has passed, right? So he's grown a little bit. What else? He's grown a lot of it. The fields are beautiful, yet not quite as I recall them. And I am troubled, for I wonder now if I'm to be a stranger in my own home. This is where I want to be most of all. And now, it's not the same. Why isn't it the same? Because of what he's experienced out there. Out in the big, wide world. Dalvin, no. You're, you're right. You will never be the same. Why? Not because of what Dalvin says next, which is true, obviously. What does it mean you will never be the same? You will never be the same as the boy you were when you left. Because he's changed. I am not the person I was 10 years ago. I have changed. I have evolved. I'm not the person I was 20, 30, 40 years ago. None of you are the person you were two years ago. All right? That's what he's getting at. All right? Now we leave that one and we pick up the Black Cauldron. And just as we did with the Book of Three, we need to look at the author's note. <clears throat> because if the author leaves us a note, okay, 
The author wants us to read it. The author's kind of saying, um, look at this. Might be important. Might kind of serve as a, a bit of a map. All right. So, the middle paragraph, in fact, the, almost the exact middle of that page. Although an imaginary world, Pradane is essentially not too different from our real one, where humor and heartbreak, joy and sadness are closely interwoven. The choices and decisions that face a frequently baffled assistant pig keeper are no easier than the ones we ourselves must make. Even in a fantasy realm, growing up is accomplished not without cost. How many of you are familiar with the Peter Pan story? What's Peter Pan's problem? He doesn't want to grow up. Tolkien in that fairy story says children are supposed to grow up. That is their end and goal. Okay? And if they don't, they become stunted. Okay? That's Peter Pan. He's meant to grow up and go off. No, but he doesn't. The Alexander is telling us here, yeah, we won't have the same choices and decisions to make as Terran Wanderer. Why? Or as Terran of Caradolfi. Why? Because we don't have a real black cauldron in our world to come search for, obviously. Other kinds of black cauldrons? Not called black cauldrons? Yeah. Are there Prince Eladirs around? Or, you know, if I look at my phone and the screen doesn't line up, it makes a really good mirror. Am I supposed to see myself in Prince Eladir and in Fluther? and in Gurdi, and in Ilanwi, and in Terran, and in Gwydion, and in Dalvin, and in Morgant. <clears throat> Council of Caradolfi. We're supposed to finish this today. Um, so we're going to go quickly. We're not going to finish it, I don't think. I don't know, because I do skip off. So, Autumn had come too swiftly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Summer's ending. Karen's doing his chores. Because now that he's back at Karen Alvin, what is he still? I was going to say again, but still assistant pig keeper. So he's got to take care of the pig. And he's there trying to clean Henwin. And this rider comes in in verbally accosts him. You, pig boy. And Karen doesn't like the way he talks to him. So he ignores him. So he accosts him again, etc. And Taryn, being the hothead that he is, mouths off. And the guy leans down while on the horse, grabs Taryn by the throat, by the jacket of his, uh, by the collar of his jacket, and lifts him off the ground. One-handed, and rides several yards to the front of Dalvin's cottage and throws him on the ground. And what does this tell us immediately about this this rider? He's really strong, because even if Taryn is 13, 14, he's probably weighing 100 pounds, 110 pounds maybe. Where he's described as bigger and stronger. Now that could be from super weakling skinny kid to less super weakling you know, skinny kid, but I don't kind of think that's the case, right? So he can pick him up with one hand, carry him, and, you know, throw him. Karen, in a sense, gets what he has coming to him, okay? So, Dalvin comes out and challenges the writer, and the writer says, middle page seven, I am a prince of Pinharki. Yes, yes, yes. In other words, F off. We'll call you when we need you. Okay. I will send for you. 
That's kind of like, hey, big boy, do this. I mean, he's putting Eladir in his place, right? And then Dalvin says, come on, Terry, you should know better than that by now. The next time, man. So, page nine. Gwydion arrives. He says, um, already getting yourself in there? I didn't make didn't seek a quarrel, but one found you nonetheless. Same thing is said in the Harry Potter novels. Harry says at one point, I don't go out searching for trouble. And somebody says, yeah, but you find yourself in troubles all the time. I think it's reminding us of that. I think that must be the way but with you, this page nine, Taryn of Caradalvin. I hope you gained as much wisdom as height, telling us he shot up. Right? Terrence, like, I want to be in the council. I want you know, Gwitty, shut up. You will be. Don't worry about it. All right? So, page 11. Various people start arriving. So, we've seen Gwitty arrive. We've seen Eladir arrive. Fluther comes. Dolly comes. Alonwi's already there. <clears throat> Bottom of 11. Another person comes in and Fluther says, that's Ariel, son of the chief bard Taliesin. Now, I mentioned the other day, Taliesin was a real Welsh bard. Well, some people say he wasn't real. That, that's all part of that. There's pretty good evidence to suggest Taliesin was an actual historical, physical person and the chief bard of the Welsh Celts. Right? Kira Dolphin is indeed honored. Which is kind of interesting, thinking, what's this little settlement named after? Who? Dalvin. That enough should honor it. All right? All right? So we see Adion, and Adion says to Taryn, top of page 12, Well met, Taryn of Care, Dalvin, and Dolly of the Fair Folk. Your names are not unknown among the bards of the north. Taryn, oh, then you're a bard too? What did Fluther just say? He's the son of the greatest bard. Now, Taryn should understand what that means. See, job, occupation, is passed on, father to son. To son, to son, to son. You know, if there's a daughter in there, probably that also. Daughters couldn't, however, be bars. <clears throat> but what's more important about what Adion says? Notice, are we told he wears the garb of an ordinary warrior, etc., etc.? Notice it's Adeon who comes up to Terran and says, Well met, Terran of Terran Dolphin. He knows who he is. How? Does Terran have a name tag? No. Does he walk around, you know, a bubble over his head saying, Terran? No. So when he says, Your names are not unknown in the songs of the North, I recognize you. From what I've heard about you. Okay. But Adion says, no, no, actually, I'm not a bard yet. My father, you know, has, wants me to do the rites of initiation. That is, I haven't passed the boards. I haven't passed the tests, so to speak. Okay. So Adion talks to Fluther, Dolly and such. He says, your gallant tales are worth all the harp strings in per day. You know, he kind of he kind of knows about Fluther's problem, let's, let's call it. Terry, top of page 13. And our names are known to him? There have been songs about us? What did Terry wish for at the beginning of book one? Terry, let's call this Karen desires list. Wants to be a hero, right? 
wants to be a warrior. Kind of part and parcel of the same. What else? What goes along with those? War? Is, is that what I heard somebody say? Glory! Honor! Fame! Notice, they are singing songs about him. Check that off his bucket list. Okay. Of course, debatable. <clears throat> and Fluther says, well, you know, after our battle with the Horn King, yeah, I composed a little something. It's a modest opera. And notice it's being sung. Okay? So, we get the council at Caradalbe. And we find out <clears throat> the cauldron's been stolen, or he's stolen. The reason for the council is they're going to steal the cauldron. They want to take the cauldron from Iran because they don't want him to be able to use it to produce more cauldron board. After the events of the last year, you know, the Horn King, all that kind of stuff is discussed. So chapter two, we get the naming of the tasks. Samoit shows up and Morgan, you know, the little chieftains, little kings, if not little, kings of littler, you know, um, kingdoms, let's say. Um, Gwydion's father is the high king. He's the king over all the little kings, right? So, all the people that are there are there because Gwydion wanted them there. He tells Fluter, page 18, I wanted you here for your sword, not for your He's like, oh, yeah, 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 we're ready to fight. Bottom of page 19. So Gwydion says, here's the plan. We're going to divide our troops into three groups. Each group will have a specific purpose. All right? And at bottom of 19, he tells us what the first group will do. The first show number, that is the people in this group, will be Dolly, Call, Fluther, and myself. All right? You might say, well, you know, that's kind of overbalanced with having Call and Gwydion in there. Okay, which might be undercut a little by Fluther, because you know, how heroic really is Fluther, but we'll talk about that later. The second band, okay, so this first group, he says, will also have some soldiers, and we'll sneak into the castle to actually steal the cauldron. Dolly, who can make himself invisible now, will do that and unlock the doors and such. Okay? At the same time, the second band of King Morgan and his horsemen will attack the Dark Gate. For what purpose? Diversion. Get them on to think this is where the main attack is. Put all his forces there. It'll make it easier for us to sneak in. You get down to the bottom of page 20, and he says, the third band will await us near Dark Gate to guard our pack animals, secure our retreat, and serve excuse me, as the need demands. So what's the third group going to do, essentially? They don't get to be in the main assault. They don't get to be the ones, you know, sneaking around in Haran's castle. Right now. And it will be composed of Adion, son of Taliesin, Taran of Caradalbin, and Elamir. What do we immediately know? Not going to work. Okay? Because Taran and Elamir already hate each other. Elder, I'm a son of Pierre Lark, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Gwydion tells him to shut up, to curb his temper. He tells Taryn, you shouldn't, you know, have made such a 
foolish, childish insult. Because Eleanor said, it's poison, I'm going to try it. And Taryn says, oh, where were you when we fought the Horned King? Where was Taryn, literally, when they fought the Horned King? Lying on his back, you know. Right? <clears throat> and so, Gwydion says, Anion will be in charge of this group. Son of the bard, not really a bard quite yet himself, etc. Bottom of that page. Eleanor, I have no wish to serve with an insolent pig boy. I'm a king's son. Whose son are you? He says to Terry. So you have stood against the cauldron born. And with Gwydion, you have no you lost no chance to make that known. That is, you said that to belittle me. Terry, you boast of your name. I take pride in my comrades. Notice what would be better for Tara to reply rather than you boast in your name, I take pride in my comrades. What should he say rather than I take pride in my comrades? I boast in my deeds. But he doesn't. Your friendship with Gwydion is nothing to me. No shield. In other words, watch your back. <laughs> Just because you're friends with Green doesn't mean I'm not going to knife you. Right? So, Taryn, middle of 22. He says, in response to Dalvin, Eleanor spoke the truth. Whose son am I? Eleanor is the son of a king. He at least has that going for him. I have no name but the one you gave me. Eladir is a prince. Notice, Taryn says, Dalvin gave him the name Taryn. Why? What does that imply about Taryn's birth or at least beginnings? Notice his mother didn't give him that name. So Dalvin didn't know the mother. Like he was wandering around, you know, one day. There's a baby lying on the ground. Prince he may be, says Dalvin. <clears throat> yet perhaps not so fortunate as you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out. <laughs> He's a prince, and yet Taryn is more fortunate. Fortunate. Has better luck. He's the youngest son of old Pilharku in the northern lands. His elder brothers have inherited what little there was of family fortune, and even that is gone. That is, his older brothers inherited it all, and what they inherited, it's gone. So they've got squat too. So Eladir has more squat, <laughs> has more of nothing than the older brothers do. Eladir has only his name and his sword. So I may be using them both for something less than a good thing. All right. So Eladir has a name and a sword. What does Dalvin do next? He gives Terran a sword. He also already gave him a name. <laughs> so now Terran has a name and a sword. And he's thinking swords, you know, Excalibur and such, Enduriel, magical swords. What are its powers? Or maybe the Sword of Shinar, if you've ever read that. I don't think Karen would like holding the Sword of Shinar. What are its powers, he says? That is, will it, will it lead me to you know, victory? Will it do things on its own powers? It's a bit of metal hammered into a rather unattractive shape. It could better have been a pruning hook or a plow iron. Pruning hook, plow iron. Implements of what? What trade? Farming. Horticulture, if you want to use a fancy word. Right? Rather than killing. This is important because of something that Adion is going to tell her in just a few pages. Its powers? Like all weapons, only those held by him who wields them. The weapon is only as good as the person who wields it. Same thing applies to other 
trades and crafts. You'll hear people say, oh, if only I had the most expensive camera, I could be a great photographer. Nope. It all depends on the eye that looks through the lens finder. If only I had the greatest paints, I could be a Picasso. Well, you don't need to have the greatest paints to be a Picasso. Uh, if only I had the greatest paints, I could be a Rembrandt. No. You got to have the eye and the touch. All right. He says, what yours are, what your powers are, Aaron. I don't have a clue. Right? So, we get the next chapter, Adeon. <clears throat> so, Adeon, Karen, and Elodir make their departure in Eladir warns the others of his horse. She bites. <laughs> kind of like Eladir does. And Adion says, your horse carries a difficult burden. And so do you. What burden do I carry? Last night I dreamed, that was all. You I saw with a black beast on your shoulders. Beware, Eladir, lest it swallow you. Eats at Eladir. Don't answer it yet. I mean, maybe we'll get to that by the end of this. <clears throat> Spare me from pig boys and dreamers. Karen, what you, tell me, tell me, please. You were filled with grief. No! What do you want to hear when you're getting ready to go out on a battle? What do sports psychologists Tell teams, you know, before the big game, before the big race, etc. You visualize. You see, your, you know, when I was in high school, I did pole vault. You, you, you see yourself planting the pole, getting the hips up, throwing the pole away, feet over the bars, the whole nine yards, landing on your back in the pit, you know, to the cheers and adulation of the one person, you know, watching kind of thing, right? What does he do? You're gonna lose. You're gonna lose badly. I see nothing but grief. Why? What cause do I have to grief? I mean, I'm proud to learn to serve Lord Gwydion, and there's a chance to win more of that. Okay? More than by washing pigs in weeding gardens. So what does Taryn think about being an assistant pig keeper? None of this. He thinks it's demeaning. He thinks it's beneath him. Look at Adi Holmes' words. And go back to what Dalvin said about the powers of the particular sword that he gave to Taryn. I have marched in many a battle house. But I've also planted seed <clears throat> and reaped the harvest with my own hands. Planted the seeds and reaped the harvest. What happens before the seeds are planted, after the seeds germinate, before the harvest? What must the sower slash planter do? Break up the ground? Till the ground, prepare the ground, put the seeds in, make sure the seeds are watered. Once the seeds sprout, what else is going to sprout? Weeds. Weed the garden to make sure the weeds don't overcome that particular plant. Then you harvest. In other words, it is a process. It is a time-consuming process. So, I've marched in many battle hosts. But I've also planted seeds and reaped the harvest. I have learned there is greater honor 
in a field well plowed than in a field steeped in blood. Notice, he doesn't say being a warrior is not honorable. He doesn't say you can't get honor in a battle. He says there is greater honor in a field well plowed than in a field steeped in blood. Shot in the dark. Why is there greater honor in that field? Than in the latter field. Okay. You've gotten really close to what I'm looking for. The field will plow means it's ready, it's prepared to give life. The field steeped in blood. What's happened? The life has leaked out. And if it's literally steeped in blood, what's going to happen to that field? For a while, at least. It's not going to support life. Okay. So the one is life-giving, the other is life-ending. And he's saying, giving life, preparing for life, saving life, is more honorable. Um, they talk as they ride alongside each other. And I've never focused on this part before. And it just caught my eye for some reason. And Anion tells kind of of his travels. <clears throat> He'd sailed beyond the Isle of Mona, which is where Alon was from, even to the northern sea. He had worked at the potter's wheel, foreshadowing, cast nets with the fisher folk, woven cloth at the looms of the cottagers, foreshadowing, and like Terran, labored over the glowing forge, foreshadowing. Those three skills, okay, throwing clay, weaving, and blacksmithing are three skills Taryn will try his hand at in the fourth book. Of forest lore, he studied deeply. Taryn listened in wonder at the Adion told the ways and natures of whipping creatures, badgers, dormice, etc., etc. There is much to be known, he says, <clears throat> and above all, much to be loved be it the turn of the seasons or the shape of a river pebble. Much to be known and above all. What does the all there mean? What does all usually mean? Everything. Much to be loved. And what does he give an ex what does he give us? Two examples of things to be loved, appreciated, celebrated. Turn of the seasons, so I can no longer live in Florida. <laughs> Lived in Florida for two years in Orlando. <clears throat> no seasons. I mean, cold is 70 degrees. Right? Or the shape of a river pebble. Remember when we were talking about Tolkien and you know the, the eyes of wonder that a child has, and a child picks up a bottle cap or maybe a stone? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about that idea of recovery, of seeing the glory, the inherent glory in everything that exists. Yeah, I know, even plastic and rubber. Why? Because it exists. Okay? So, he says, Indeed, the more we find to love, the more we find to love, the what? The more we add to the measure of our hearts. What did Meduin say about Terran's heart? Anybody remember? And? 
He does say it was unformed. He says it was. There's something about it being full. Page 124 wasn't in the chapter written about that. You right after. <coughs> Your heart is young and unformed. If, if I read it well, you are one of the few I would welcome here. Indeed, you must stay if you choose. It's young. It's not fully developed okay, and unformed. Here he says, uh, Ariel says, the more we find a love, the more we add to the measure of our hearts. And he's kind of implying the larger our hearts grow. How many of you are familiar with Dr. Seuss? And, know where I'm going? Where? The Grinch. What happens to the Grinch? Christmas morning, he gets up, he climbs up you know, to the top of Mount Crumpet, expecting to hear the who's down in Whoville wail and lament their loss. And instead he hears them still singing some of it. His heart, we're told, what? Grows ten times that day. And the Grinch becomes the ungrinchiest person you know, in the world. Okay? The measure of his heart becomes larger. Why? Because he learns to love more. Notice, it's the more we find to love. Not just the more we love. Okay? There's a difference there. The more things, the more of reality we discover to love. And bear in mind what that word discover literally means. To uncover. To see the lovable in it, all right? So, you know, Karen's mind just kind of, he doesn't understand all of this. Um, we're going to go on a bit. They meet up with Gwydion and his group, and Karen, you know, Top of page 35, just begs, let me go with you. I don't want to be in your belly and bubble. And Gwydion is like, man, do you love danger so much? Before you are a man, you will learn to hate it. Notice, before you are a man, you're not one yet, Karen. He's still an adolescent. He's got a lot of growing up to do. And fear it even as I do. No, nope, you're going to stay here. Jared's like, you know, I'd even go with Morgan. Top of the next page. Adion, he's a brave and powerful man. But I am uneasy for him. In my dream, the night before we left, warriors rode a slow circle around him, and Morgan's sword was broken. That is, I saw Morgan in a barrel. Dead. That's why the soldiers are riding around the hill. It's why his sword is broken. Adion. Uh, Karen asks, Do your dreams always come true? What? Are you a prophet? Are you a seer? Adion. There is truth in all things if you understand them well. Now that's a nice dodge. He says, my dreams are all true. If you understand them, that is kind of, you know, if you look at them from one perspective. Remember in the uh, Star Wars movies? You know, in the first one, Obi-Wan says, Darth Vader killed your father. And in the third one, the spirit of, you know, Obi-Wan comes back and he's like, Ben, you lied to me. Or is it second one? Second one. 
Ben, you lied to me. You said Darth Vader killed my father. What does Obi-Wan say? Your father ceased to be Anakin Skywalker when he went over to the dark side. So you see, from a certain perspective, what I said was true. When Darth Vader came into existence, Anakin Skywalker died. Ergo, Darth Vader killed Anakin Skywalker. And he's like, he should be a lawyer, not a wizard. Okay? So, in the shadow of the dark gate. No, 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 no. Nah, we're going to skip that. We don't have time. Huntsman of Anubin, we can skip. They meet up with Gwistol, or, or Guistul, however you want to pronounce his name. Um... Here's a passage I'd like to talk about, but I'm not going to. And we get to chapter 7 with Call, okay? The Crow. And page 63, we hear Call go, Urzu, Urzu, Urgok. And Fluther's like, that bird's saying something, right? And so Gwistel interprets for us, bottom of page 63. All comment to say, is that the cauldron is in the hand of Orthu, Orwin, and Orgok. That's all. In other words, the cauldron isn't where? In Anubin, at Iran's stronghold, where Gwydion and his group, and Morgan and his group are going to. They don't know that it's not there. Okay? So, Karen, who are they? Um... Maybe you should say, what are they? Okay, what are they? I don't know. So they go back and forth, talk about a bunch of things. And they obviously have a decision to make, right? Or do they? Karen thinks they do. What does Karen think the decision is they have to make? Karen thinks they have a choice at this point. What's that choice? To get the cauldron is one of the two choices. Or to continue with the plan. To go follow Gwyn and set out you know, with the pack horses and to be there for the retreat when it's needed. That, that is the plan, right? Do the others acknowledge that there's that choice? I love it's kind of like, um, Gwydion said we need to do this. We should just do this. But like, there's not really a choice. What's Karen thinking, though? And Eladir, by the way. Yeah, but we get the call from that. What? All fame, power, glory, honor, and mine, you know? <clears throat> so. They go back and forth. Eladir says, I'm going off after the cauldron. No, no, you pig boy. You you go be Gwydion's good little boy. You go do what Gwydion told you to do. Right? Bottom of 67. Alonwi says, <clears throat> Karen of Kiragalbin. Notice she doesn't say, Karen, assistant pig boy. You're only making excuses for some harebrained idea of your own. You've been talking and talking, forgotten one thing. You're not the one to decide anything. Because what has Adeon been saying throughout this little combat? Nothing. She says, Adeon commands you both. Karen, oh, that's right. So he turns to Adeon. Adeon says, nope. This choice cannot be mine. How's that for passing the buck? I have said nothing for or against your plan. The decision is greater than I dare make above my pay grade. I'm not going to decide. Karen, why? Of all of us, you know best what to do. How? How does he know best? Okay. You see things that 
perhaps you will understand one day. For now, choose your path, tearing your fair Alden. Wherever it may lead, I promise you my help. Choose your path, and I will help you. What is Adeon saying to Terry? Keep going. Keep going. You're 99% there. You're the leader. Where you lead, I will follow. With all my knowledge, all my dreams, blah, blah, blah. Okay? What did Galvin say to Taryn at the end of the previous book? When Taryn said, I wasn't there, I didn't do, I didn't do, I didn't. You led everyone. All right? Taryn draws back. Then she kind of retreats, stays silent for a moment, and says, I shall go to the marshes of Morva. He doesn't say we. Why the I? I don't read. You don't have to come. Dolly, you don't have to come. Luther, you don't have to come. Adeon, you don't have to come. Even though he said, wherever you lead, I will help. He's saying, this is what I'm going to do. No one spoke. And Dolly goes, oh, okay, guess I might go well with you. But it's a mistake. <laughs> Luther, no. I'm going to. I'm, I'm not sitting back. In other words, in for a penny, in for a pound. So, Crystal's like, goodbye, have fun storming the castle. <laughs> Princess Bride reference here. <clears throat> and we get chapter eight of Stone in the Shoe. Okay. Taryn and Arlonry are talking about Elodie. And Taryn says, I think he really would have tried to bring back the cauldron by himself. Bottom of page seven. And you know how much chance he would have had alone. That's the kind of childish thing I would have done when I was an assistant PT. What's the when I was mean? Well, yeah, I'm not any longer. You're still an assistant PT for a long we brings them back to Earth. You're going to these silly swamps because of Elodie. So, who's the more childish? And anything else you say is pure money. See what? I don't mean this literally, kind of metaphorically, symbolically. What role does Ilanwi partially play for Karen? She's kind of like his conscience. He's like, I'm gonna, and there's this other this little voice over here. <laughs> kind of goes, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't say that. Remember who you are. Don't tell me it wouldn't have been wiser to find the room. In other words, finding the cauldron, that's a task for Gwydion. But no, you have to decide the other way and drag the rest of us along. No. What did he say? I am going. So why does she mean, why does she say you're dragging us along? going to abandon you. And in saying that, she's implying, again, not stating, Taryn, you are our leader. All right? So, middle of 71. Taryn rides up alongside Adeon and says, you know, Bad choice. I wonder now if we should not turn back. What's the problem with the idea of turning back? Have any of you read The Road Less Traveled? By Robert Frost? Two roads diverged in a wood. And what happens? He takes you one road, the speaker takes you one road. 
And we find out, and I shall be saying, ages and ages hence. The ages and ages implies like after death. That I might have taken the wrong out. You know, because way leads on to way, and I realize that I'll never be able to get back. And one of the readings, the way that poem is read, is that the roads diverging are two choices. You take one, and what happens to that other choice? It's gone. It's erased. And that decision then leads to two more. You take one, and all the possibilities of the other one are now gone. Now there's an a infinitude of possibilities as a result. And each time, you know, possible universes, so to speak, poof, out of existence. All right? Terry. You kept something from me. And had I known what it was, I would have chosen otherwise. In other words, I didn't have all the information I needed to make the wisest choice. So, where do you keep it from? Adion kind of doesn't respond. Taryn has a, notices this look on Adion's face. And it was pride more than that. There was a light that almost, that seemed almost joyous. Where is that light? Is it like, you know, someone cue the spotlight? No. Or is it coming from within? And after a long pause, Adion says, there is a destiny laid on us to do what we must do, though it is not always given to us to see it. What does that mean? There's a destiny laid on us to do what we must do. Like everything is fate, everything is determined, everything is foreordained. You know, Adion is a good, strict Calvinist, you know, believing in predestination and everything. Possibly. I don't think that's really where he's going. Tara, I think you see a lot of things. Okay. That I think you see in a lot of things comes in response to, though it is not always given to us to see it. He hears that word see and says, you see a lot more than I do. Tell me what you see. He says, it's been in my mind for a long time. The dream he had. The last night in Kirdal. You saw Eladir, what? With the black beast on his shoulder. You saw King Mordant in the burial mound. Not literally in, but you saw King Mordant, his men riding around the mound, his broken sword. To me, you foretold, I would grieve. What did you dream of? That's kind of a personal question, admittedly. Adding out, oh, that's been bothering you since? I saw myself in a glade. What's a glade? It's like a little meadow, an opening of trees. You know, so you have a forest, and then you have a little opening. And there might be a few trees here and there, but it's pretty much meadow. And the winter lay all around... It was warm and sunny. Birds called, flowers sprang up. Man, Karen's like, man, you had a good dream. Notice what Adion doesn't say. We can jump ahead and read pages. He doesn't say how he sees himself in the glade. Lying dead. He omits that part. Good on you, man. That's a beautiful dream. But I can't guess its meaning. Terry, it is beautiful. I, I thought it was an unhappy dream, and that's why you didn't speak of it. Mm, getting close. Right? Um, so Taryn tells Eladir there's something wrong with his horse. Eladir gets off. Taryn goes, and Eleanor warns him, you know, 
The horse is going to kill you, kid. And Karen gets up to the horse, lifts the hook, and finds what? A stone buried in the hook. Now, what is Karen showing there? Where do you get that knowledge? From being an assistant preacher for Gary Dalton. He learned what? He learned something about horses and why horses go lame. He learned how to approach a horse, how to lift the foot, the, the leg, to get the hoof, how to dig out a stone. There's a place deep in the hoof, middle of 74. Anyone can miss it if they don't know. Here's something Tara knows that maybe the others don't know. It was Carl who showed me how to do it. Tara never expected that. Because Eleger doesn't get it. But the angry thrust of Eleger's words took him aback. Eleger's hand was on his sword. Terran noticed, felt a surge of anger. He just wants to lash out, but he doesn't. Your honor is your own, and so is yours, you see. What stone is in your shoe, Prince of Denmark? What is bugging you? What is, why does he say what stone is in your shoe? Notice he doesn't say, what's that black beast on your back? What is the stone in the horse's hoof done to the hoof? Done to the horse, excuse me. So what's the stone, the metaphorical stone, in Eladir's shoe doing to him? It's making him lame. It's making him ill at ease. It's diseasing him. He's saying, Eladir, something is wrong. And until whatever that disease is, is cured, it's only going to get worse. It's like when you have a wound and it's not treated properly. And the wound closes over, but what happens? The rot sets in until eventually you get gangrene. And, you know, you got to lose the arm, lose the leg, or maybe the gangrene gets so bad, you die from it. That's being implied here, right? Page 75. Adion, who watches all this, says to Terry, I commend your patience. Remember when we talked about patience the other day? What does patience kind of mean? Have been in the class. Might have been another class. What's one of the meanings of patience? Like your five-year-old kid is Christmas and you celebrate Christmas, and Christmas is two weeks away, and your parents are really cruel SOBs, and you got an big Christmas tree, and it's just you know loaded with stuff. Two weeks before Christmas. And you go up there, hey, hey, hey. be patient. What is telling a five-year-old two weeks before Christmas to be patient really mean? Suffer. Wait. Right? I admire your suffrage, your suffering, your being patient. The black beast spurs Eladir cruelly. Huh, now we get another image of the black beast. It's like Eladir is being ridden by a horseman or horse. And it, just as he digs his spurs into the horse's flanks, the black beast is digging into Eladir. Terry, I think you'll feel better once we find the call maker. I never noticed that before. Boy, is that good. Beautiful moment there. Huge foreshadowing. Uh, there will be glory enough for all to share. What? No, Terry. Just when you really seem like you're starting to learn, you fall back on your old prosaic, you know, blue, glory, honor, fame, power, majesty, dominion, ever and ever. Adion, is there not glory enough in living the days given to us? Come on, Terry. Think bigger. Think larger. 
think wider. Think deeper. What was the Tim McGraw song years ago about the, the guy who finds out he's going to die? Live like you were dying. What's he going to do? He's going to ride the Bronx. He's going to jump out of the airplane. In other words, he's going to live life to the fullest. Right? This, by the way, is recovery. Is there not glory enough in living the days given to us? Don't worry about glory off in the future. Live now. You should know there is adventure in simply being among those we love and the things we love is beauty too. There is adventure and beauty in being among those we love and the things we love. Okay? Who obviously is adding on not with right now? His fiance. His fiance. But I want to talk to you about something else. Middle of 75. He says, I have few possessions. Why? Count them of little importance. Like at the end in, in one of the Harry Potter books. Harry's in Dumbledore's office and he's just smashing stuff off left and right. Book five. And Dumbledore's like, go ahead, Harry. Have at it. I dare say I have too much stuff. Material things don't mean anything to add on. He says, but these two few things I do treasure. Polagor, my horse, my packets of healing herbs, and this. And he touches the brooch that he's wearing. The brooch I wear, precious gift from Ariach Lynn, my betrothed, should any ill befall me, they are yours. All of these. Notice he doesn't say, oh, and by the way, take the brooch back to my fiance. They're yours. I watch you closely, Terrence Belden. In all my journeys, I have not met one. I have met no one else to whom I would rather entrust them. Okay, now, almost his first words to Karen were what? Back in the beginning. I've marched with a lot of battle horses. And now he says, I've never met anyone to whom I would entrust these more than you. Who does that obviously include? His fiance, his father, Taliesin, the greatest bard, Prince Gwydion, probably Prince Gwydion's father, King Math, Dalvin, and ch -ch 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 all the people in those battle hosts he served with. He's essentially saying, you're the most worthy of all these people. No, 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 nothing's going to happen to you, Herod says. We're companions. We'll protect one another. Come on. Your gift, that's friendship enough. It's just pot boiler blather. Oh, I don't want anything from you. It's just having your friendship is. Nevertheless, we cannot know all the future holds. Will you accept them? Yes. Good. Why, oh, good. How can Adion, skip a few pages, now die? Relief. He knows these things will be cared for. Right? So, they get surprised by the huntsman in bottom of 78. We see Adion with a dagger in his chest in chapter 9, the breach. The huntsmen right away, and we're told page 80, second paragraph towards the end. 
The wind howled above the trees, but this sheltered spot, by contrast, seemed warm. The driven clouds broke away. The sun turned the branches to gold. So it's winter, but it looks like summer. Adione raises himself up, kind of looks around. His gray eyes scanned the glade. He nodded briefly. Yes, this is a fair place. I shall rest here. Rest how? Yeah, requiesce in pacum. He's going to rest in peace here. Hey, Taryn, we're going to heal your wound. Adion, I'm comfortable. Pain's gone. It's pleasant here. Warm as spring. And Taryn suddenly realizes, your dream. Yep, much like it. You knew, you knew there would be peril for you. Why didn't you speak? You knew this is what was going to happen. Why didn't you stop me? I would never have stopped the Martian. We could have turned back. He could have saved himself. What is Adion in his dying breaths teaching Terry? I don't know. Maybe you could paraphrase it this way. I could be way off base here. He who would save his life must lose it. All right. Indeed, that is why I dare not speak of yet. I have learned to begin, I have yearned to begin at the side of my beloved Aaron. My thoughts are with you now, but had I chosen to return, I would ever wonder whether my choice was made through wisdom or following the wishes of my own heart. If my choice was wise or motivated by my love for my beloved. Notice, they're not the same. I see this as it must be, and the destiny laid upon me. That is, this is how things were meant to be. Terry, you saved my life. Greater love hath no man than that he die for his friend. Well, why did Avion end up with the dagger in his heart? Because he got in front of Terry. He says, take this, take the brooch off, hand it to Terry. And he says, you shall live, Adion. Take it. This is not my command to you. Taryn says, you shall live. Adion says, take it. This is not my command to you, but the wish of one friend to another. Taryn takes it. <coughs> Adion dies. Okay. So, 82. Um, Taryn has dreams, we're told. Like his spirit, Terran's dreams were confused, filled with his main fear. In them, he saw the mournful face of the companion, the calm face of Adion. He saw Eladir seized by a black, breed, but a black beast that sank its claws, gripped him until Eladir cried out in torment. He saw a turbulent stream with a great boulder, all foreshadowing, etc., etc. Okay. Top, bottom of 83, he and Arlan were talking. And Alon says, if you had made him jealous over that silly horse, Terry, I feel pity for Eladir. Has he expressed pity for him before? Nope. Adion once told me he saw Black Beast. He says, now I understand a little. Alon, wow, that just blows me away, Terry. That's not like you to say that. Why? What is the brooch giving Terry? Or maybe another way to put it. What is it revealing in here? Because it's not really the brooch that does this, right? Taryn thinks it is. Taryn thinks it's the brooch that gives him these powers. All the brooch really does is it opens him up to use the language Adion used. The wonders of the world. To see that everything is to be love and such. And suddenly, middle of 84, he's aware of vast activities of the forest trail, squirrels, etc., birds, the air, the sounds of the water and such. Right? <clears throat> so, 
So let's see. They talk about Adion Skiff. We get the Martian to Morva. They rescue Fluther. Find Fluther if you want. Just before the cottage, end of chapter 10. They arrive to this cottage. They look in the windows. Very bottom of page 94. In one corner stood a wide loom with a good many of the threads straggling down. That is, the tapestry on the loom is not finished by any means. It's almost like it's just begun. The work on the frame was less than half finished and so tangled knotted he could imagine no one ever continuing. Tangled and knotted implies what? About the, the work on the loom. First of all, it's a work in process. What else? Or in progress. You can't make out the image, right? It just looks like junk at this point. It doesn't make any sense. Right? Broken crockery covered a small table. Rest in a broken weapon were piled about. So we have a loom, we have crockery, pottery, and we have weapons. Again, these three things are going to be brought up in book four. Right? So let's skip a bunch. Who do they meet in this cottage? Orwin, Orgok, and Orzu. Orwin, Orgok, and Orzu. What are they? Anybody know? They're the fates. These are the three fates. In Germanic myth mythology, they're called the Norns. Okay? In Greek mythology, they're called the Fates. And in fact, I kept forgetting, so I had to write their names down. In Greek mythology, they are Clotho, Lepesis, and Atropo. Clotho is the spinner, Lepesis is the weaver, and Atropo is the cutter. Okay. Clotho spins the thread of your life. Okay. Lachesis weaves the thread of your life or, or takes the string and weaves it into the thread that hangs your life. And after Paul goes, you're done. Okay. That's it. So, Skip a bunch. Taryn mentions Lady Strong Care Dolbin. They ask, How is little Dolbin? He's like, What do you mean, little Dolbin? Okay. And they talk about Dolbin and the choice Dolbin made. What choice did Dolbin have? He could have a sword, right? He could have. A harp, a sword, page 105, or the Book of Three. He can have a sword. He can become the most famous, greatest warrior there was. He can have a harp. He could become the most famous, greatest bard there was. Or he could get a book and become the greatest enchanter. All right? So they mentioned, yes, we do have the crocan, as it's called, the black crocan. And Karen and the others come up with a plan. We're going to steal it because they find it in the, you know, the storehouse. And that night they go back. They're kind of camping outside. They go back up to the cottage and they look in page 117. And what do they see? They don't see three old, fat, saggy hags. They see three swimsuit models. Inside the cottage, three figures went about their task. They're beautiful, the monk said. Terry, I don't know who they are, but they're more powerful than we thought. So, 
They say, sure, you can have the black cauldron. But you got to exchange it for something else. Right? And it takes a long time before the final price is achieved. Why? What must be given up for the black cauldron? Anybody? Louder? Yeah, ultimately. But what's, what are they saying? Because they don't say, oh, give us any on fruit and we're all square. What do they say? You got to give up the thing you love the most. All right? But they offer some other things. For example, they say, well, Page 122. We're sure you can find something to offer in exchange. Uh, you know, for example, give us the north wind in a bag. Can't do that. Well, okay, okay. How about the south wind? No. Oh, okay, okay. Um, nicest summer day you can remember. That'd be nice. You can't say, Jeremy. So what do we see? Terrence says, my sword given to me by dog. And that ain't going to work out. All right? He says, shoot. And he immediately thinks Addy on Uh But he doesn't offer it. Gurgi says, take my wallet given to me by Gwydion. What does this wallet guarantee Gurgi? He'll never be hungry. Literally, he will never be hungry. Right? He says, it is all poor Gurgi has to give. Like the widow in one of Jesus' parables, who throws in her last mite, her last penny. Gurgi gives everything, right? Nope, not good enough. Ailanwi says, um, the ring. Would he give her this ring? Nope. She says, I've got something else, too. She brings out her golden spear, the ball that she carries with her everywhere, which will be really important in the next one. Nope. Don't need that. Right? Luther. The harp. And what does the harp have? It has the string that will never break. Karen finally says, I'll give you the gift. I'll give you the gift. Page 127. Karen says, you could have slain us. You could have just taken it. Do you not understand, poor chicken, like knowledge, truth, and love themselves? The clasp must be given willingly, or its power is broken. You have to freely give it up. Or what it does won't work. And she says, that is just like knowledge, truth, and love. Right? He says, yep, this is it. So, Karen says to them, page 128, and we'll probably stop watching this. Each of you would have given up what you treasured most for my sake. That is, why does he mean for my sake? To save me? No. Yeah, kind of. But to keep me from having to give up the thing I treasure the most. I'm glad Orthu didn't take your heart, Luther. I know how unhappy you'd be without your music, even more than I without my bridge. And Gurgi, you should never have tried to sacrifice your food on my account. And Alonwe, your ring and your bauble are much too useful. All of these things are double precious now, and so are you, the best of true comrades. All right? But then they still need to learn how do you destroy the Black Cauldron? Because that's what the whole purpose is, right? The entire plan was to capture the Black Cauldron and destroy it. Oh, well, I could have told you that before. A living person has to willingly jump into it in order for it to be destroyed. When he does, the croaking top of bottom of 129 will shatter. Of course, the person who jumps in won't come out alive. 
You must sacrifice yourself to destroy it. Gurdy jumps back. You know? <laughs> yep, that's the way of it. It only cost you a breach, but it will cost a life to destroy it. Well, <laughs> the breach already kind of what? Kind of already cost a life. It was because of the breach that Adion was able to have the dream that he had. He knew what was going to happen. He wanted to make sure Terran got the breach. Why? Because Adion probably foresaw also this, and he knew Ad he knew Terran would need the breach. So he exchanged his life for the breach. Okay, we'll stop there. Uh, for Tuesday, yeah, we'll finish this probably in the first half hour. So get into Castle of Lear. There's a quiz due tonight, I believe, 11.59. Um, and I'll probably, I'll have another quiz ready maybe Sunday or Monday over, what are we reading? Over the Black Cauldron. No, take that back. I won't have that until after Tuesday. Okay, that's all.